it's been too long, so let's get straight to what's been happening in the House of Windsor, both current and former, and so much more. The lady who knows more about the royals than anyone even in the royal family. Well, that's the some somewhat of a big introduction, but there we go. Angela Levin, she literally wrote the book about Camilla, and she's got plenty to say about Harry as well. Lovely to see you, mate. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to you. I'm really pleased to see you again. And you, you look wonderful as always. Now, I was uh, quite stunned to see that yet another book is starting to tell us what some of the insights were about uh, the late Queen Elizabeth II, including that she was particularly put out by the decision of Harry and Meghan to name one of their daughters Lilibet, which of course was her nickname. Yeah. Well, the, the author of the book is Robert Hardman, and he's a terrifically good um, writer, journalist, and um, has got in very politely with the royal family. It's absolutely riveting. It comes out um, on Thursday in the UK, but it's, it's really riveting. And this thing about Lilibet is very interesting. I, at the beginning, thought that it was a terrible thing to do, to take a very private... Um, name and, and use it um, because it was um, Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth, she couldn't say Elizabeth, so she could say Lilibet, so that's what she said about herself. So her parents called her that. And then um, the, the Duke of Edinburgh, her much-loved husband, called her that. And it was a very endearment word and very um, private and uh, couldn't believe that Harry and Meghan said she was gave for them the go-ahead and it would be all right, partly because Meghan had already put the name down of Lilibet Diana on a, a domain on the internet, and that meant quite obviously that in the future she would want to use that name to buy things, to promote programs and all those things. And it would inevitably draw the queen into that, which I thought was beyond rude. So this um, aid, and you must remember that Robert does not just shove things down. He's well in with everybody there, knows what he's saying, that the queen was upset. And she said that, um, I don't have palaces and I don't have paintings and now I don't have my name. Hmm. And one of the aides said that she has never seen the Queen in all her many years being so angry. Um, and I think people have said, oh, well, you know, Meghan wanted to be friendly. I think quite the opposite. I think she wanted to get her own back. And I think this was number two, which followed that incredibly phony, exaggerated curtsy that she did on Netflix um, when they did a six hour boring moan about their lot. Um, and um, I think that it was something she wants to get her own back and she wants to be nasty because she does still feel, she keeps on about feeling that she wasn't treated in the way she wanted to be. The way she wanted to be was queen because she doesn't like being second, third, fourth, and certainly not sixth in line for anything. And um, it, it just, um, it's just awful. So now they're furious apparently absolutely furious so that's quite good <laughs> well, well correct and good good on someone being able to put you know i mean obviously the queen's not going to come out and say it somebody who's got uh, the information uh if you trust them i trust them that, uh, that this is what was being said but it is also the insight too about the the private versus the absolutely intimately private and how Megan neither didn't know the difference or didn't care. And that's somebody who uh, rolled into a family uh, as opposed to uh, was respectful of the family that was there before she turned up. Yes, that's true. I mean, I do know that it was very, very difficult for her to change countries, to live in a family that was unknown anywhere else in the world and to fit in. But, you know, a lot of people were trying to help her um, the now Queen Camilla tried to help her, she wasn't interested. And the now Duchess of Edinburgh also tried, she wasn't interested. Harry told me when I did his biography that he was trying to tell her as much as possible about what is okay and what isn't. But she didn't really want to know. 
I mean, my, my view really, in a way, is that Omid Scobie, who's written these two awful books where they've slated the royal family, is um, talking on their behalf, and that Robert Hardman is talking on the more dignified half of the royal family, because they have obviously kept quiet all the time. They don't feel it's appropriate for them to say things about it and get involved in an argument. So it's been passed on to him, and I think this is what he's doing. They're fed up with them going on and on and on and being um, really unpleasant. So they're actually showing what is perhaps true and what isn't. But what is nice to see is that the name Elizabeth, the far more uh, publicly known uh, way of referring to the late Queen, is now being spread amongst the family as, uh, as an important middle name. Yes, nearly all the children have, have got that as a middle name. Um, uh, Harry and Meghan's daughter has got Diana as a middle name. I mean, you don't have Lily, but Elizabeth, that would have been ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, that would have been really ridiculous. Yes, so the, the memory carries on. And I know that all of the um, William and Harry as well, they keep lots of um, photos or pictures of her on the wall. And so they can point and say, who she is, but she can't be forgotten. She's the most, she was the most extraordinary woman. And her legacy is passing on through King Charles because he is following a lot of her ways and he's also very spiritual. And he also um, is, is very kind and works very hard. His whole life has been devoted to becoming king. He won't stand down just because a few people say, well, we'd rather have a young man, um, Prince Ed uh, William. Um, he, will, he will stay there as long as he possibly can. And uh, the book also apparently gives us some insight about uh, the frustrations that King Charles has had with Harry. Uh, what are we learning about that? Yeah, well, this is very interesting. One of them is when the queen became very ill. I mean, we... The family knew that she had uh, cancer and that she was getting more and more frail. And um, but they thought it would be, you know, weeks uh, rather than days. And it all happened very suddenly. Um, in, in fact, it was very gentle. The aide who was with her, um, but obviously not in the bedroom, but knew what was going on. Princess Anne was with her, and by chance she was there. But it was very peaceful. She fell asleep and there was no pain. And so it was a very, very gentle death. But it meant that they hadn't realised that how uh, serious it was. And King Charles had to zoom over by helicopter. Um, he had spent um, quite a long time with her a couple of days before with Camilla. So that was comforting. But he, he missed her actually dying, which he'd wanted to be. Um, William was whizzing over there. Catherine, um, it was their three children's first day at a new school. And she had a decided that she must be there. She's the mother. I mean, she's a very hardworking mother as well as a wonderful princess. And um, so William uh, flew off. Now, Harry started an argument that he wanted to bring Meghan to the deathbed. Um, you know, she might have a wire inside her or something like that. But as Catherine wasn't coming, they felt it was easier to say, no, she can't come. And Harry was saying, well, how are you going up there? She was trying to get hold of William. Which plane you're taking? I want to come on it. And he was arguing and arguing and shouting. And he said that his father, in, in Spare, the book, these memoirs that he wrote, that his father was very disrespectful to him and um, a very unappealing. And of course, you know, if your mother, any mother is dying, you're not sort of trying to organize a flight for somebody really. Um, you're, you're, you know, you're overwhelmed with the feeling that this is the moment that you'd hope would never happen. And um, so uh, the, the Williams aides have told Robert that um, they could have, they, he didn't call them. That's who they should have called. They would have sorted everything out for him. So he was making a mountain out of something that was tragic, but which he wasn't using his common sense.
Yeah, well, it's obvious that, uh, you know, at that time, Prince Charles, now King Charles, uh, yeah, isn't the bloke who ends up booking flights. Uh, the aides, the staff are able to do that. And as you say, when he himself is trying to rush to get there, it's pretty obvious where uh, his mind was going to be. Is there anything else about the book that stands out to you that's going to produce headlines uh, when the world gets to see it later in the week? Yes, well, it's interesting. Um, today I found out that um, William is not at all religious, unlike the Queen Elizabeth and uh, King Charles. And he goes to church on at Easter and uh, Christmas, but he's not really interested and he doesn't feel comfortable in a spiritual sort of place. So um, he's thinking that he doesn't, when the time comes, he doesn't want to be leader of the church which is what King Charles does. And he has made it of all religions. But uh, um, William isn't a feeling about that. And it would be the first time since Henry VIII wasn't in charge of um, the religion of the country. So I, I think that's very interesting. I mean, young people aren't so keen on religion. We know that now. Numbers have gone down. I don't know whether you have the same thing in Australia. but Very much so. Yeah, their numbers have gone down, but somehow you feel they want to. They want to do everything, you know, be in charge of the church, um, look after the people, look after the Commonwealth, and and um, be everybody. And I think William will be focusing on different things rather than his father, but not things like climate change. They both absolutely agree with that. And luckily, they are close now. I think they've moved closer because of Harry and the upset and the pain. But um, King Charles has also said, you know, he can't keep on listening to all this. Um, and he, he puts it into different sections in his brain. So this is the Harry arguing and moaning, but actually he's got to get on and be king and do what's necessary. Well, it seems that, uh, you know, King William, whenever that event eventually happens. Uh, well, the idea that he will be more committed to changing the weather than uh, the church of which he's supposed to run, very fitting for the generation of which he will represent. Angela, thank you very much. Do appreciate it. Thank you. It's lovely to speak to you.